1989, the Cavalcante family boss John Riggi has become the central focus of a series of massive racketeering trials. In the 1990, gets 15 years behind bars. With him gone, Gaetano Vastola would become his acting boss, but Vastola was sentenced shortly afterwards and disappeared from the scene, leaving a new power vacuum that was then occupied by John D'Amato. D'Amato was a puppet of the New York Gambino family and had been conspiring to murder many of his own gangsters. The family higher-ups then learned that D'Amato was secretly a homosexual, and so they finally decided he had to go. In 1992, D'Amato was murdered by family soldier Anthony Capo and his second-in-command Gioacchino Amari took his spot. Amari was a solid Italian gangster who cleaned up the scene in North Jersey and elevated the family from their failing position in the early 90s. However, in 97, Amari would pass after struggling with stomach cancer, and family conciliere Stefano Vitabile would establish a three-man panel to run things as the family stabilized. Meanwhile, family associate Ralph Guarino would organize a robbery at the North Tower in New York City, which failed miserably. He secretly became a wire tapped informant following and got close to family gambler Joe Masella. Masella was whacked in 98 however after accumulating half a million in debt and Guarino went with Joe Sclafani. The three-man committee would then fall into internal conflict leading to one man coming out on top the highly respected Vinnie Palermo, and things in the region would stabilize as the family made more money than ever. Crime in New Jersey. This time, calling repeated mob boss Simone de Cavacanti or Sam the Plumber before a federal grand jury. Of those charged, the most important is Sam de Cavacanti, reputed head of a prominent New Jersey mafia family and well known to the FBI. Who... Yeah. Police informant had been rigged with a hidden tape recorder, and then he talked to people to whom he owed money. In one conversation, played in court today. It's January 10, 1999. People all over America are sitting at the television to watch the premiere episode of the new crime drama series, The Sopranos. The show followed the life of North Jersey crime boss Tony Soprano as he leads his family, the DeMeo family, into the new century. Among the people watching are members of the actual North Jersey, the Cavalcante family. Later that day, the men discussed the show with confusion over the phone. The mobile phones they spoke over were provided to them by secret informant Ralph Guarino, and he had convinced the men that the devices were untraceable and bootlegged. In fact, they'd been speaking over the phones for months on end by this point. The men talked about the series and the weirdly similar things it had with their own lives. Joe Sclafani, talking with Anthony Rotondo, said, Every word they said was recorded on FBI wiretaps and printed into transcripts. Guarino and Sclafani had been speaking for some time, and he'd learned a lot about his new friend. Sclafani was an openly violent man who often bragged about the number of men he'd buried, somewhere around 20. Using his reputation on the street, Sclafani built a profitable extortion career, but he wasn't earning enough to really elevate his position in the family. And by the time Guarino had been moved to his crew, the man was down on his financial luck. Sclafani, however, liked Guarino, and the two men slowly became good friends. As a result of this, he began to open up more and more and say more risky things in their conversations, things Guarino was able to catch on tape. 
They don't know where the body is, but one guy. Somebody digs a hole first, and that's the guy that takes it. He just dumps it in and covers it. The man in question Sclafani was referring to was later discovered to be Philip Lamella, who owned a large property in the upstate where he hid all the murder scenes. In one conversation, Sclafani talked about a hit job he was planning and told Guarino about how he wanted the job to be done on a motorcycle, of course, for cinematic value. However, he didn't have a cycle, nor did he know how to drive one. And so, he and his wiretap partner went on and on, back and forth, trying to plan a murder by motorcycle. Speaking of cinematic value, The Sopranos continued to captivate the gangsters. In years past, the De Cavalcante organization had been seen as nothing more than a group of Italian rednecks with a minor scale hustle. They'd always been forced under the iron hand of the New York Commission, with the Gambino family taking charge of North Jersey in the late 1980s. However, by the late 90s, New York had suffered from so many massive RICO prosecutions that they were forced to back off of North Jersey. The five families still had branches out there, but they were just that. Meanwhile, the North Jersey family had become more violent and more profitable than ever, the men at the top bringing in millions. They led quiet suburban lives, many of them owning large luxurious homes and holding traditional blue collar work. In fact, the guys in New York would often joke about their associates in Jersey, making comments about how they all held legitimate 9 to 5s. However, the gangsters had secret double lives that were hidden from the normal Americans around them. But now, things were different. The De Cavalcantes were now the focus of the media world, a spot once almost solely allotted to New York. People were talking about them, and in a strange show of life imitating art, the men began to take on the styles and personalities of their screen counterparts. They spent their days watching and raving about the show while hanging out at Sacco's Meat Market, only a few blocks away from the fictional Satrial's Meat Market, the gang hangout in The Sopranos. The gangsters would liken themselves to the men on screen, with one guy noting over the phone that the Soprano family even had a topless bar, like the one owned by family boss Vinny Palermo. The country was talking about them, and they were finally gaining notoriety for their work. As the North Jersey gangsters spent their days watching The Sopranos, things in the region continued on. The organization had seen some major changes take place since the end of the short civil war between warring bosses Charles Maggiore and Vinnie Palermo. The two men had been a part of the gang's three-man leadership panel, established by longtime conciliar Stefano Vitabile years prior. However, as expected, the two men quickly became enemies. The war quickly ended, however, with practically no deaths, as Palermo came out on top. Meanwhile, Maggiore went back to being a street captain, while Girolamo Palermo was demoted to the role of underboss, making Vinnie Palermo the sole authority in the region. The gangsters also began to sniff out the rats and undercover cops in the family. Although things were going good in Jersey, with little open law enforcement attention on the men, they knew things were going on behind the scenes. Palermo himself began to suspect that something was off about Ralph Guarino. He'd only been an informant for a little over a year by now, but the boss had grown suspicious of him. He wanted Guarino dead, but he needed proof before he made a move. Meanwhile, an opportunity to make Guarino had presented itself right to Scalfani's front door in the form of Frank D'Amato, the brother of murdered boss John D'Amato. D'Amato had been killed back in 92 for a number of reasons, namely his allegiance to New York and his sexual deviance, which had been exposed by his girlfriend. However, with him gone, his brother had become a target of the now power-hungry Palermo. He gave the job to his underboss Girolamo Palermo and his conciliar Stefano Vitabile and had them work with longtime mafioso Francesco Polizzi.
Polizzi, born all the way back in 1936, was an old school figure. He was recognized as a family soldier in the late 50s under then boss Nick Delmore. He worked under San de Cavalcante, the future boss of the organization, and was heavily involved in the regional narcotics trade. When de Cavalcante became boss, however, he had John Riggi take over his old crew, not Polizzi. Polizzi continued operating in numerous mafia rackets, remaining a family soldier. He was never a highly recognized name in the media or to law enforcement. As the 70s rolled around, with Riggi slowly taking charge of the organization, Polizzi's drug empire continued to grow, with him focusing mainly on heroin and cocaine. He worked with family member Joseph Ganchi, both men based out of De Cavalcante's old Newark crew. Polizzi finally saw a massive career promotion in the early 80s, when De Cavalcante officially retired. Riggi became the new family boss, leaving the role of the Newark captain vacant. Polizzi rose up and took charge of the crew, and he ran his operations from Ganchi's Pizza Restaurant. Near the beginning of 1985, however, Polizzi's career took a sharp turn downwards when the feds began targeting the international Italian drug trade known by the moniker the Pizza Connection. The Connection was a nine-year-long crime operation that saw the arrival of almost two billion dollars worth of heroin to the US. Polizzi held a role in the connection, and as a result, was brought to court. The feds brought his wife to the witness stand to give testimony regarding one surveillance scene in which Polizzi was caught picking up a duffel bag from another gangster. She tried backing her husband's claims that the bag was filled with sardines that she needed to make him pasta, but no one believed her. On March 2nd, 1987, Polizzi and 21 other co-defendants got two decades behind bars and he went silent for a while. On April 3rd, 1995, Polizzi walked out of jail. He was suffering from a severe case of lung cancer, and the prison medic stated that he only had six months left to live. As a result, the judge decided to let him out early. Polizzi returned to North Jersey and was back on the street almost immediately. He had his old crew back, his old operations minus the drugs, and was earning yet again. When Polizzi went back to work, the family administration decided to elevate his role, seeing as he was a highly experienced and respected old school gangster. And so, they let him join Amari's inner circle, and he worked heavily alongside gangsters like Giuseppe Schifolitti and Vinnie Palermo. Following the family's civil war, the leaders of the organization's Newark faction, namely Majuri, were kicked out of Elizabeth and pushed back to Newark. Polizzi, although a high-level member of the Newark faction, was close to Palermo and Vitabile, and they allowed him to remain in the family's administration. That now brings us back to the Frank D'Amato murder plot. Palermo wanted D'Amato gone, as the man was a clear threat to his regime. D'Amato was angry over his brother's death, and openly vowed revenge against his new boss. However, he wasn't really a strong candidate, and his plan to fight back had been silenced over the years. Now, however, with Palermo as boss, things were different. Sclafani was excited at the prospect of having Gorino do the job, as it would make him a candidate for official membership into the family. He proposed that Gorino be given the contract and be made following, and when the feds realized what was about to go down, they figured that it was finally time to pull their informant off the street. Gorino stopped answering his phone calls, and no one knew where he'd gone. Meanwhile, the feds began to prepare a heavy case against the organization, and things in Jersey would go back to normal for the next few months. It's now December 2nd, 1999. Police sirens ring throughout the streets of Newark and Elizabeth as police begin going door to door with arrest warrants. 
of the men captured are Palermo, Capo, Sclafoni, Abramo, Vitabile, Rotondo, and Schifaliti. Over the next few hours, police raid numerous mob hangouts, homes, and locations. And by the end of it all, over 40 men are in cuffs. When they entered Palermo's home, the officers had found a suitcase full of clothing and personal belongings. And it was clear the boss was trying to lament, but it was too late. As it turns out, just before the arrests, Palermo had called up Anthony Rotondo and told the capo that he was going on the run and wanted the man to join him. However, since Palermo knew that indictments were coming, Rotondo feared that Palermo suspected him of being the informant who'd given the police the in to arrest the men. He gave the excuse that he couldn't leave his wife behind. However, in reality, he didn't trust Palermo and feared that if he went with him, he'd never see Jersey again. By the end of the raid, authorities had arrested virtually the entire organization. Anthony Capo, by this point in time, was still nothing more than a soldier in the family, and now facing life in prison, he almost immediately flipped and began regurgitating as much info as he could come up with. The gangsters were brought forward and called to trial, and it was there Palermo learned the actual severity of his situation. He was facing life and possibly capital punishment. The gang boss took some time to reevaluate his situation. He was a successful man, with a large loving family, a big beautiful home, a perfectly legal business he loved possibly even more than his actual career as a criminal, but was now going to lose all of it and spend the rest of his life in a jumpsuit, sleeping in a cage, on a thin old mattress. And so, in 2000, Vinny Palermo, the boss of the Decavalcante Mafia family, decided to make the ultimate decision and flip to the state. After flipping, Palermo admitted to his role in the murder or potential murders of Weiss, Lorasso, the D'Amato brothers, Majuri, Masella, and even his strip club manager, Tom Salvada. He explained all the plots in their entirety and revealed the roles of his co-conspirators. When word of his treachery got wind to the other gangsters in the organization, a domino effect took shape. Suddenly, everyone and their mother wanted to cut a deal and get out of jail free. And that's exactly what happened. In 2001, Rotondo flipped, and following him, Frank Scarabino, one of Fred Weiss's murderers. According to Scarabino, he'd been ordered to murder the families of Rotondo and Capo, an old school idea taken from Sicily and proposed by Polizzi. Scarabino was also facing charges for the murders of Daniel Annunziata, Weiss, Lorasso, and the attempted murder of Vastola by John D'Amato. These things collectively pushed him to testify. Following him, Victor De Chiara, one of John D'Amato's killers, would flip as well. Anthony Greco, one of Joe Masella's killers, was caught in Pahrump, New York, and ultimately decided to flip. Following Palermo's flipping, John Riggi set up a new three-man panel to run the organization, this time of Girolamo Palermo, Stefano Vitabile, and Giuseppe Schifelitti. Made man and family loan shark Joe Miranda became Palermo's new acting underboss. Miranda was an old-school man, being a World War II veteran and had held a reputation spanning decades. He was a very close associate to De Cavalcante and later Riggi, and was now the family's underboss. Meanwhile, Polizzi's cancer had grown worse and worse. On Christmas Eve of 2001, he passed from lung cancer. In 2001, Sclafani pleaded guilty to loan sharking, extortion, and illegal gambling. His lawyer made it clear that the old-school gangster would, quote, not cooperate with anybody about anything. He received an 8-10 to 10 year long sentence, and that same year, Scifoliti was held under house arrest while awaiting trial. Due to all the men flipping to the state, the rest of the family was brought forward, and everyone got a piece of the pie. In 2002, Vitabile went to trial on numerous charges, and as a result, Frank D'Amato took his place as acting conciliaire. That same year, James Gallo was convicted and sentenced to anywhere between 25 to 30 years behind bars. 
Conselvo and Rago would be convicted for the murder of Lorasso, but both men ended up accepting a plea agreement that sentenced them to two and a half decades behind bars. In 2003, Frank D'Amato confessed to Rico conspiracy charges only two weeks before his trial and got 10 years. That same year, police discovered that Riggi had been running the family from behind bars and had been dishing out murders through his meetings with Vitabile. As a result, in September, his sentence was extended by an entire decade. Later that year, family captain Charles Stango got 13 years for conspiracy to commit murder alongside a crew of 10 others. In late 2003, Abramo, Vitabile, and Schifoliti were convicted for a number of murder charges. Then, in 2004, Girolamo Palermo was convicted as well and got house arrest. Meanwhile, on July 29, 2005, a year before the trial sequence had even concluded, Sclafani walked out of jail, an aging but free man. By this point in time, the failing organization was led by Miranda in Riggi's place. In 2006, Philip Abramo was sentenced to life behind bars for five counts of first degree, loan sharking, stock fraud, and more. Schifoliti was tried for two counts of murder and two counts of murder conspiracy, and in 2006, got life in prison. And in the same trial, Vitabile got life as well. That same month, Girolamo Palermo got over 20 years behind bars. With Vitabile and D'Amato both in jail, the role of conciliar then went to family captain Frank Negro. Later that year, Charles Majuri was convicted and sentenced as well, signifying the end of the massive trial. By the end of it, most of the organization was sitting behind bars, with over 10 men having flipped to the state. Palermo, Capo, Rotondo, Scarabino, and Greco all went into Witsec. As the sun continued to set on the now practically dead De Cavalcante family, things went silent in the region for a while. Joe Miranda came out of the trial as the new acting boss of the family, and he began to try and put the pieces back together. Following the conclusion of the trial, most of the men in the family were behind bars, and there wasn't much money being put out on the street. Between 2005 and 2006, Miranda made a dozen new men into the organization, many of which were younger Sicilian immigrants. And as soon as the trial was over, the gangsters were back out in the street, earning for the new boss. However, nearing the end of 2006, the new skipper decided to step down to the role of underboss, and Frank Guaracci became the new boss. Guaracci was born all the way back in 1955 in Ribera, Sicily. Ribera was the historic homeland of the family, and in 1967, Guaracci's family came overseas to the US. By 1989, he was a made man, inducted by then-boss John Riggi, and remained a soldier until 2005, when he was promoted to capo. Following Miranda stepping down, Guaracci would become the official acting boss of the family, running the day-to-day -day rackets alongside his underboss. Guaracci continued to improve the scene in North Jersey in hopes of recovering fully from the destructive indictments. Meanwhile, Abramo, Vitabile, and Schifoliti were about to receive some good news. In September of 2008, the three men began to petition for their sentences to be cancelled due to a technical issue their lawyers had discovered, and a federal appeals court decided to look into the case. Apparently, during the trial, the prosecution had brought forth eight co-conspirators to give statements against the three gangsters. However, the co-conspirators had already taken plea deals prior to, and according to an unrelated 2004 Supreme Court case, the statements given in plea deals were considered inadmissible in the trials of other defendants. And so, the lawyers argued that their sentences should be overturned and the men retrialed. The appeals court decided to toss out the cases and retrial the men, since they were the only three who never accepted a guilty plea. Schifoliti got out, while Vitabile got out in 2013, and Abramo in 2018. Girolamo Palermo also tried appealing his conviction, but his situation was different, and on March 2nd, 2009, his appeal was rejected, 
And as of today, he's still behind bars. In 2009, Charles Majuri walked out of prison and returned to the streets. Meanwhile, life also continued as normal for Vinny Palermo, who was now hiding out in Houston, Texas as the owner of numerous topless bars in the city. It was discovered by the New York Daily News that Palermo was living under the assumed name James Cabella. The police had been coming after the ex-mobster as they alleged that his strip clubs were centers of illegal prostitution and drug rings in the metropolitan area. The next morning, following the news report, KPRC-TV began an investigation into Palermo and aired it on live TV and only 40 days following, the gangster put his Houston area mansion up for sale. He reduced the price over time but in June of 2011, decided to take the listing down, since it wasn't selling. Nearing the end of that same year, Palermo was sued by the former owner of one of his clubs, as he had only paid 5k of the 1.3 million dollar price he'd bought it for originally. But on March 4 of 2014, he filed for Chapter 11 bankruptcy. His house finally sold in 2016, and as things stand today, both of the clubs he originally owned are now closed down. Back in Jersey, the gangsters were yet again facing some legal issues. By 2009, Guaracci was the family's main leader, operating as an acting boss on Reggie's behalf and working directly alongside underboss Joe Miranda. However, in 2010, Guaracci was indicted for extortion after he tried to force the Lenny's Brick Oven Pizza in Washington Township to pay him a protection fee. On July 4, Guaracci and two other gangsters, 29-year-old John Coaster and 60-year-old Michael Noble, walked into the busy restaurant around 9pm. Guaracci approached the restaurant's general manager and began poking him in the chest as he described himself as the guy in charge. He told the owner that the establishment would have to start paying daily protection to the family and demanded that the man hand over the nightly receipts to one of the gangsters with him. When he said no, however, the boss fell into a fit of rage. He began yelling curses at the manager as customers fled the restaurant with unfinished meals left behind. Guaracci told the manager, quote, I run the show, as he and his two bodyguards left the place shaken up. Although Guaracci had never been convicted of any crime prior to the incident, the two men around him had different stories to tell. Nobile had been a street thug in Brooklyn, who was arrested in 2000 for assaulting a victim with a bat. However, after getting out in 2005 on parole, he went back to the victim and made sure the man wouldn't testify. Following this, he began to hang with members of the De Cavalcante family. Coaster, although without a prior arrest, was a man who hung out at the pizza place often and had already threatened the owner before the incident. In January of 2012, Guaracci got six months of house arrest, which would be followed by five-year-long probation. Meanwhile, on January 23rd, a 52-year-old Anthony Capo would pass from a heart attack while at home in Witsec. Conselvo and Rago were released on February 14, and both men returned to work in the street. While awaiting Abramo's release date, Consalvo would become the acting captain of his crew, since the men were in-laws. Consalvo was likely going to see a bump up the chain to an administrative role in the coming few years. Later that year, Frank D'Amato left prison and returned to the street as a family soldier. On November 27, 2012, Reggie finally stepped out of the Devons Federal Medical Center after sitting behind bars for over two decades. He was an ailing man who was slowly dying, and so lived in an assisted living situation with a doctor in Edison. 
On December 24, 2014, a 91-year-old Miranda would pass away, and in his place went street boss Joseph Merlo. Then, on August 3rd, 2015, a 90-year-old Ridgie would pass away. By that point in time, he'd been family boss for three and a half decades. And with Ridgie gone, Guarachi would be elevated to the position of official the Cavalcante boss. It's 2012. FBI agent Giovanni Rocco enters a casino steakhouse in Atlantic City, South Jersey. He's there under the false identity of Giovanni Gatto, a North Jersey outlaw biker turned mafioso, and he's procuring a purchase of cocaine from Jimmy Smalls Heaney, an Elizabeth-based cocaine dealer who worked with the Bloods gang. Rocco and another agent meet with Smalls at the restaurant to buy a 200 gram bag of coke in exchange for a supply of counterfeit designer clothing the government had seized in a prior sting operation. The agents got their coke and left. The plethora of luxury items established a solid name for the undercover Fed, and through his new connections with Smalls, Rocco would meet a man named Luigi Olivieri, an alleged made man of the De Cavalcante family. <laughs> Luigi was a sloppy man who earned an okay pay and ran a pizza place in Elizabeth. He had a reputation for disrespect after an incident with Sclafani in which he poked the man in the stomach as a joke. Rocco and Olivieri got closer with time, and Olivieri ended up inviting the agent to an Italian feast in Peterson, Elizabeth. The agent continued his undercover operation into the local drug trafficking ring, which had now transformed into an investigation into the Mafia family as a whole. In one incident, Rocco was standing at his daughter's soccer tournament when he was approached by Gambino mobster Danny Bertelli, who he knew through his gangland connections. Bertelli, confused as to why Rocco was there, said, quote, Giovanni, what are you doing here? Rocco quickly made up a lie that he was there to help out an ex-girlfriend, whose husband was behind bars, and the Mafia soldier believed him and continued on his day. Eventually, with time, Rocco rose up in the organization and finally met Charles Stango. Stango was an interesting man. A capo in North Jersey, Stango resided in Las Vegas. He was an animated character who, recklessly, often spoke over the phone. He'd been arrested back in 2002 for murder conspiracy, and after getting out a decade later, moved to the suburbs of Henderson, just outside of Las Vegas. As caught on wiretap, Stango explained his reasoning for moving to Henderson. I planted the fucking flag in fucking New Orleans, in Las Vegas, fucking LA. Essentially, he was trying to grow the diminished crime family's reach across the US and into profitable territories like Vegas. The Gambling Central had long been an essential element to the Chicago Mafia outfit, but following a series of failures in the 70s and 80s, the gangland presence there had diminished. Stango used his son to carry out his orders on the street back home in Jersey, talking to him mostly over the phone. When Rocco rose up in the organization, he managed to infiltrate Stango's crew and thus get close to the mafioso's son and later the mafia captain himself. He tapped the man's phones, which led to an almost constant stream of surveillance on the many rackets they were running. The agent quickly learned of a massive beef Stango was facing with Olivieri, a man he despised as much as a person can be despised. Although Olivieri was technically a made man, most of the other gangsters hated him and refused to accept him as one of them. Stango, however, had a special hatred for Olivieri due to the disrespect he'd shown the old school Sclafani, and he wanted the man's head for it. Rocco then flew out to Vegas to meet with Stango for the first time. The two men met at the captain's suburban home outside the strip, and they quickly got down to business. Stango immediately expressed his disgust at Olivieri, telling the agent that he, quote, 
gotta maim him, or you just gotta put him in a wheelchair for the rest of his life, or somebody's gotta get a fucking jar of acid and throw it in his fucking face. Then, he told Rocco that he wanted him to take care of the hit contract, and that would in turn lead to Rocco getting made. The FBI had to think and act quick before it was too late. It's February 1st, 2015. Undercover FBI agent Giovanni Rocco flies out to Las Vegas to meet with New Jersey Captain Charles Stango for the second time. Stango wanted to plan the murder of Luigi Olivieri with the agent, and so the two men got down to business. He told him he wanted to get two outlaw bikers to do the hit, which would pay each of them 25k. The plan was for the officer to give the two bikers each photos of Olivieri and have them stay a while in Elizabeth as they stalked the man's day-to-day -day patterns. Although the family administration had not been informed of the hit job, Stango reassured the agent that it'd be okay, and that afterwards they'd come to accept it. It turns out Stango had reached out to family conciliaire Negro for approval on the hit against Olivieri, but he'd never gotten a direct answer back, and this had ultimately saved Olivieri's life. Irregardless, this is where the operation had to end. They now had Stango planning a murder on tape, and as a result, they quickly pulled Rocco out of the field. It's now the early morning of March 12, 2015. Officers knock on the front door of Charles Stangle's home in Henderson, Nevada, where the gangster lived with his girlfriend. They also targeted nine other men back home in Jersey, including family conciliar Frank Negro and Stango's son Anthony. The raid was the largest one since the December 1999 arrest wave, and the men were booked for drug trafficking, prostitution, and murder conspiracy charges. During the trials, numerous pieces of evidence were brought forwards, including a taped conversation between Stango and his son, in which the men discussed propping up an illegal escort business in Tom's River, a New Jersey township that had become a central hub for the De Cavalcante family. You need to protect yourself with what you're going to do now. You have to be smart. Very smart, Stango told Anthony as he continued explaining the plan in detail. He instructed his son to set up a perfectly legal club with low drink prices as a front for the prostitution ring, as that kind of establishment would attract high-end, white-collar businessmen. He told his son to be as legally under the radar as possible. Anthony told his dad that his idea was to set up an out-of-view warehouse where the central escort business would be based. The prostitutes would charge whatever price they decided, but the mafiosi would get a $350 cut per hour, $50 of which would go to a criminal lawyer the younger Stango had hired. Although the lawyer was never named, his role was to set up the illicit business and post bond for anyone who got in trouble with the law. He only spoke in person with the young Stango, who apparently secretly had escort-related blackmail on the man if he ever decided to flip. Also charged in the investigation were the guys working in Heaney's crew, including Olivieri, for selling coke and stolen cigarettes. Meanwhile, some internal changes were taking place over in Jersey. On April 14, 2016, family boss Frank Guaracci, an ailing Sicilian gangster, passed away after suffering from cancer. With him out of the picture, his role went to the aging Charles Majuri, who had been vying for the spot since his placement on the three-man panel two decades prior. He was finally running things in the region, although now incredibly old. The Tom's River crew continued to face legal issues. Stango's son Anthony pleaded guilty to his charges, getting six years in late 2016, and on December 7, Stango pleaded guilty as well to conspiracy to commit murder. As a part of his plea deal, Stango's other charges would be dropped, and he got 10 years behind bars in March of 2017. Meanwhile, John Capozzi, Nicholas DeGidio, and Mario Galli, members of Stango's Tom River crew, were all charged for trafficking coke. 
All 10 of the men involved ended up pleading guilty and taking deals, including Heaney. Heaney got 5 years, while Olivieri got off with a pretty light sentence, since his only charge was possessing contraband cigarettes. He got out around 2019. Negro was never charged for any crime, but after his arrest, stepped down and was replaced by Giuseppe Schifoliti. The Toms River and Haney crews had been dealt a serious blow, and since they were some of the remaining silent crews still earning for the organization, it also dealt a deadly blow to the entire family. As things stand, the De Cavalcante family is in a strange state. Since the bust against the Toms River operation and the rivals in Elizabeth, not much has happened with the organization, a sign of the new world they live in. In April of 2017, Mafia soldier Jerry Balzano pleaded guilty to physically assaulting a driver during a road rage incident. Balzano was one of many charged back in 2011 in a mob sweep the largest sweep in American history that saw over 120 men arrested. Although the investigation targeted New York, a few members of the De Cavalcante organization were arrested, including Balzano, who was charged with tax refund theft and possession of contraband. He was out in two years on supervised release parole. The day of the road rage incident, the driver of the vehicle in question caught Balzano off on the upstate highway, leading to Balzano slowly pulling in front of the man and stopping his Lincoln sedan. He then got out of the car, walked towards the driver, and began to yell at and attack the man. The entire thing was caught on the driver's dash cam, with the incident being diffused by another driver. Many have speculated that the other man was in fact another gangster who knew Balzano. Balzano gave an apology in court, saying, quote, I'd like to apologize to the court for taking up your time, and to my wife and children, as well as to the gentleman I had the altercation with. I just lost control, and it blew out of proportion, like a snowball effect. Although the soldier was facing a two-year sentence for parole violation, he ended up getting 11 months behind bars and 21 months of supervised release. On July 9, 2020, Mario Galli pleaded guilty to drug trafficking and firearm possession. The then 28-year-old Galli had been charged with drug trafficking while armed with a loaded 9mm. And following a police raid on his home, they found hundreds of grams of coke as well as the gun in question. At the time, he was out on supervised release following the 2015 Tom's River bust. On June 3, 2021, underboss Joseph Merlo passed away, leading to Philip Abramo taking his position. In July of 2022, Stango was released early and went to move into a New York halfway house. On January 2, 2023, family capo Paolo Farina passed away at the age of 96. He'd been an old-time gangster who had a long and decorated career in the organization since its very beginnings, and his death was a shock. The current state of the organization remains unknown, although most believe that the De Cavalcante family has gone under and is essentially all but dead, cases like those of Stango and Galli prove otherwise. 
In fact, it seems as though the North Jersey family is very active and still getting noticeable under the table action. However, it seems to have undergone a similar effect other supposedly dead families across the nation have experienced. Since the destructive trials of Palermo, Capo, and Rotondo, the Mafia has slowly transitioned from an organized Italian syndicate into another organized crime group like those across the country, focused mainly on business. Although the men of the old generation are still in charge and running things in the family, those under them are likely no longer Italian or even half Italian, but rather unorganized criminals who picked up work under the family. There's no longer a major incentive to get made in the Cavalcante organization, considering the high police attention the role brings with it. Although it's unknown how many made men and capos are actually out on the street in North Jersey today, it's likely not many. They, like the other Mafia families across the country, have shifted noticeably from their old practices to much more business-focused ones. Things like white-collar crime, fraud, and prostitution. Meanwhile, a lot of the men involved have focused almost entirely on regular legal business work, leaving behind most of their old mob rackets. The necessity for getting into Mafia crime that once existed within their communities has died with the shifting American culture. Most of those who lived the life didn't want it for their children, and those children grew up to be regular adults who didn't want it for their own children. And with the new wave of social gentrification in America, the rise of the digital information age, the increase of security measures across the nation, and the shifting focus of police from organized crime to counterterrorism, the future of the family as a traditional mafia seems bleak. But the futures of those younger men still seriously involved with it may be promising, but only time will tell.